talking about optimizing your blog for Google, Facebook, and Pinterest. I'm going to focus specifically on what you do on your blog or your website itself. So I'm not talking about how you do, then go and do marketing on Facebook or increase your Facebook following or increase your Pinterest following. I'm not talking about those things, but specifically what you can do on your website itself. Um, and these are accessible techniques that anyone should be able to use and implement and only add a little bit of extra time to the blog writing process. So a little bit about me. My name is Catherine Cowley or Kathy Cowley. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. You can email me. This slide um, deck is already online at slideshare.net slash Kathy Cowley. So if you want a copy of the slides, that's available. I have worked as a producer on feature documentary films. I worked as a producer for a radio show for an NPR affiliate station for a while. I have a master's of English and I've taught English 101 at Mesa Community College and Brigham Young University. So I've done a variety of things. Primarily though, I am a writer and that's what I'm focusing on right now. And so I've had this website as in, I have short stories and essays published, but I don't have any novels published. So as an author, you have this problem. I show you that here. So I'm on KatherineKelly.com, that's my author website. And then my husband and I are developing an Amazon affiliate website called Givesome, which is not officially launched. So if you go there and there's some pages that aren't complete, that is why I haven't officially launched it. Um, anyway, so my website, KatherineKelly.com. If you the problem as a pre-published author is that you have absolutely no audience, and there's no clear uh, idea of who your audience should be. So I decided in 2013 that I was going to get serious about my website. So February 2013, I completely redesigned my website, and then I spammed all my Facebook friends and said, come check out my website. So February 2013, I had 127 visitors to my website, 250 page views. So fast forward to now, um, so it's been 20 months since then. I've done 40 blog posts, so that's not very many, that's two a month. I've really only been putting a few hours a month into my website. But last month I had 1,575 visitors with 2,290 page views. And the primary way I've done this is one, I've written interesting blog posts, but the primary way I've done this is through optimization. So, uh, sometimes I've unintentionally optimized. My most popular blog post is about my companion llama named Evelyn. I actually don't have a llama, and I've never even been close enough to touch a llama. But I wrote this humorous blog post called about Evelyn, and I unintentionally optimized it, and it was showing up in Google. Number two on the search term, companion llama. To my website to read about my companion llama, and then found out I was making fun of companion llamas and leaving my website very <laughs> So, uh, luckily, I've been moving down in the Google rankings. I'm now number six if you search for companion llama, which I'm really glad about because this is not my audience, it's people that are searching for companion llama. <laughs> um, my most popular blog post that I've done 10 keys to writing dialogue in fiction. This is my audience. One of the, you know, I figured out this is kind of what I want to be going for. So I spent a number of hours writing it. It's one of my longer posts. Um, I initially had a few hundred visitors the month that I posted it. It got shared a bit, but because I optimized it for Google, Facebook, and Pinterest, my audience has slowly been increasing for this. Last month I had 700 visitors to this post. I've had 7,000 visitors to this post this year, um, which for putting in a handful of hours a month into my blog is not bad. Um, so you post a blog post, hopefully you get your 15 minutes of time, <coughs> as Andy Warhol once said, and then very quickly it ends up in the blog archives. So if people will come and visit it once in a while, people will trickle there, occasionally visit, but it doesn't have to be this way. If you optimize, this could be your cemetery. This, this is the Taj Mahal, a, ma a mausoleum, three million visitors a year. So I'm obviously not to that point yet. I'm still a kind of a small fish in the realm of blogging, um, but I've learned some things and if I were to put more time into it, I would really increase my audience even more. So if you want to be the Taj Mahal, 
a blog post, your content must be first be stimulating. If you don't have good content, it doesn't matter. Then it needs to be searchable, shareable, and savable. So we'll come back to this in just a second. And feel free to tweet with my name and text Phoenix attached at any point. Um, so stimulating content, uh, one thing I like to go back to is actually from Aristotle. Over 2,000 years ago, he wrote on rhetoric, and he talked about what we now call the rhetorical situation. And there's really three components about it. This is a modern iteration of Aristotle, that any time you're writing, you have an audience, a subject, and a speaker. And so you figure out what you have to say, like what personally can I bring to this? What is my ethos? What experiences have I had with this? Who is my audience? What do they care about? What are they reading and writing and talking about with whatever subject they're in? And then what's my subject? What are the things about it I find interesting? What are the things about it that no one's written about? So write your stimulating content. I could give a whole class on how to do that, um, but I'm not going to. So then for the other three things, which is what I'll be focusing on, you want your content to be searchable. Um, that's through Google and other search engines. Also, to a lesser extent, Pinterest. Um, 20, it's something, 20 something percent of Pinterest users use Pinterest to search instead of Google. Um, you want it to be shareable. That's going to be through Facebook, through Pinterest, through other social media. And you want your content to be savable so people can say, oh, I like this. So they either post it on Facebook or they tweet about it or they share it on Pinterest. So, first, we're going to talk about the search engines. Um, organic search, that's people accessing your website through search engines in general and websites across the US accounts for about 50% of websites visits. There's, there was a study done in June that argues it's actually 64%. But the more conservative estimate is that search engines are accounting for 50% of website visits. So that's why you should care about them. Um, so in terms of the big search engines, Google is the biggest. Google accounts for 67% of searches go through Google. So you care about Google first, then Bing and Yahoo are the other two big players, and then everyone else is just a little fish that you don't really have to care about. So Google's who um, you look at. So for my blog post that I was talking about, 10 keys to writing dialogue and fiction, it shows up number two in Google when you type in writing dialogue exercise. So the question is, why does it show up number two? Why doesn't it show up on the third page? Or why doesn't it show up number one? What are the things that are going into <coughs> its rank positioning? How does Google and other search engines determine that? So Google rankings are determined by two things primarily. First, your content. Is it relevant for a particular word or phrase? So someone searches for something, and Google's trying to get you the most relevant information, that this is going to be the most helpful for you. So you really can work on that. Um, that's what I'll be talking most about in this presentation. And then credibility. So Google wants to rank to people that are credible. And so how does Google determine if you're credible? Well, it's how popular your blog post is compared to others. So the more people are linking to you, and the better those links are, if this is a link from a .edu website, well, that's a really credible link. That's going to give your website and your blog post credibility. Um, links from other bloggers, that's what's going to give you credibility and make you um, higher up in the search results. So when you're going about this, first you have to say, is this a blog post worth optimizing for? Because not all blog posts are worth optimizing for. When you're creating content, there's two main categories of content that I see. There's probably others, but this is one way to think about it is that you have hedonic content. This is entertaining. Sometimes this is personal experiences or storytelling or you know, kind of reflections or criticism or you know, stream of consciousness or, oh, I went to this cool event and I wanted to write about it. So you have hedonic content. It's harder to optimize for, but sometimes you can do it. Um, then you have utilitarian content. <coughs> and this is resources that you're providing um, for example, my post, 10 Keys to Writing Dialogue and Fiction, that's a resource. It's a practical thing, and those are actually really easy to optimize for. So when you go about optimizing, what do you do? First, you write an awesome blog post. <laughs> Second, you find out what people are searching for. And I sometimes do this while I'm doing number one. I'll do this while I'm brainstorming or drafting. So but how do you know what people are searching for? Uh, it, the most easy accessible tool to find this out is called t Q 
keyword tool. So if you go to keywordtool.io, you can find out what people are searching for on Google, Bing, YouTube. And so what keyword tool does is you type in your keyword. A keyword is what people are searching for. And so you type that in, and it's going to give you other ideas of keywords that people are searching for. So I type in writing dialogue, and I can see, wow, these are all the Google autocompletes with writing dialogue. So I can see, well, there's people searching for all of these things, writing dialogue exercises, writing dialogue in fiction. People are searching for writing dialogue in an essay. I can say, well, my post isn't about that. I'm not going to go for that keyword. So you can see there's all of these things people are posting for. So you can choose these keywords. So if I Google writing dialogue, I can see that my website doesn't have a chance of ranking for that term, of being on the first page, because it's all really big players. It's Writer's Digest, which is the national magazine with you know, tons and tons of subscribers. It's these really big websites that are ranking for writing dialogue. So I want to make sure that I'm targeting some of these other keywords, and I chose writing dialogue and fiction and writing dialogue exercises, so that way I have a chance of ranking. So then once you've chosen your keywords, the most important thing is you include your keywords in your title, your URL, and within the text of your post. Basically what we talked about is Google wants to know that this is relevant. So to prove that it's relevant, if these keywords are in all three of these places, then it's relevant. Google is going to say, oh, this must really be what this post is about. So for example, my blog post, my URL has 10 keys to writing dialogue and fiction. This has 10 keys to writing dialogue and fiction and two dialogue exercises. I knew I'd have a lot of searches for that. So I wanted to make sure I had exercises in the actual title. And then I, of course, included it throughout the post. This is just one screenshot of the post. So to be perfectly optimized for a term, words must be in the exact order as the search. So if I want to be, you know, it has to be the exact phrase people are searching for, to be perfectly optimized for it. So the only term I'm perfectly optimized for, well, I'm perfectly optimized for writing dialogue, and I'm perfectly optimized for writing dialogue in fiction. I'm not perfectly optimized for writing dialogue exercises, but I'm still ranked number two for it, fortunately. Um, but that's you know something to know. If you really want a particular phrase, have that exact phrase. Then another thing you want to do is include related keywords in your post. So the website my husband and I are building is called Give Some. Um, it's an affiliate marketing site where we make money by sending people to buy things on Amazon. Um, my husband's another affiliate marketing, and we realized there's a lot of niche market of people searching for graduate student gifts. And so we decided to build a whole website out of it. We've done our keyword research and stuff. So this page, gifts for film, media arts, and screenwriting graduate students and professors. You can see which keywords I really care about that I put in the title. We've actually decided that we don't want really long URLs. We prefer, we've decided to sacrifice that SEO for just something people can type in, give some slash film. Um, but so, the, you can see what my main keywords are, which are right here. Um, but you can also see related keywords. What if someone types in presence for film graduate students? Well, I'm not going to show up unless I've included the word presence in my post somewhere. So I'm not gonna put that in my title, but if you include some synonyms in your post, if you really care about optimizing for that, then include some of these things people also might be searching for. Um, the next tip is use analytics. If you don't know how many people are accessing your website or what they're looking at or what they're doing, you can't know if what you're doing is working and what your most successful posts are. There's actually an entire presentation this afternoon about analytics, <coughs> I really recommend. So I use Google Analytics, it's robust, it's free, you can install it on any platform. There's other ones that you can use as well. So this, I've set Google Analytics to see the whole year. This, actually, this is from, no, this is my whole last, I can't remember what I, what I said this from. You can see users, you can see page views, you can see all sorts of information. I can go through and see <coughs> what are my most popular posts, how many hits have I get, Roxy, Companion Llama, number three. Um, <laughs> My kangaroo post, another throwaway post that I <laughs> shouldn't have optimized for, number five. Um, you can see where people are coming from, and within these categories, you can get more specific. So for social, you, I can see that I'm getting most of my hits from Pinterest and some from Facebook. So all those things, go check your analytics, learn how to do that. Um, tip seven, create an optimized page that links to your hedonic posts. 
So sometimes you can actually tweak your hedonic content, this kind of entertaining or storytelling content or things that are hard to optimize. You can tweak it so you actually can't optimize it. So if you were going to write about the summer I spent gardening, well, you could shift your post to five keys to back porch gardening in Arizona. And you could still include these same anecdotes and narratives, and but you can really optimize for that. But sometimes you really just want to write the post about the summer I spent gardening and really tell maybe an Annie Dillard style like, you know, your experience in your garden. And, and it really doesn't work to have that sort of five keys um, title. So I actually have this, that I wrote a series of posts that were sort of entertaining, sort of useful, but completely unable to optimize. I wrote a series of posts about writing metaphors. So I wrote, writing is like kissing, an entire blog post comparing writing to kissing. Writing is like exercising. Writing is like play spinning. No one is searching for writing is like kissing. If they were, they would click on my website. Mm -hmm. No one's searching for that. So what I did is I came up with a bigger category, mm -hmm. metaphors about writing, and I did a whole page on my website for this. So once I'd accumulated enough blog posts of this kind of entertaining type I couldn't optimize for, I, I did my keyword research, found out, okay, there's actually a lot of people searching for metaphors about writing, pretty low competition. And so I created this blog post. You can see I've optimized the URL, the title, got an image, I've added actually entirely new content, and I actually want to go back and redo this page. I'm getting enough visitors that I'm like, I can revamp this and make this page a lot better. But I just threw this together in an hour, and now I'm getting 400 hits a month on it. And then people are linking through and actually visiting my writing is like kissing page and these other posts that otherwise would be in the graveyard entirely. Yeah. Before you get too far from it, that's a really awesome typewriter picture you have there. Oh, thank you. I love the flicker. <laughs> but I'll be talking more about Flickr in a second. So, uh, the next tip is post consistently. So, Google wants to index you uh, if you're a blogger, but it all it depends on certain things. Um, if, partly, if you're a really credible website, everyone wants CNN's content and they're posting constantly. So, Google is crawling them constantly and constantly putting in the search results. I, on the other hand, am posting once or twice a month, sometimes three times. So Google, I can count on, is probably going to index me at least once or twice a month. But if I stopped posting and started posting once every six months, Google's going to check back after a month. Oh, she hasn't posted. They'll check back two months later. Oh, she hasn't posted. And it's going to you know, get much larger time between when they check. And so even if I post this amazing post, I'm not going to be indexed or shown up in the results for quite a while. So it's important to kind of post consistently, even if it's just little pieces of content that you're not going to SEO to just keep you in Google's radar. Um, you can also participate in basic link building. This kind of gets off your website, but it's such an important part of SEO, search engine optimization, that I'm just going to touch on what anyone can do without actually knowing anything about link building. One, if you do a guest blog post. So if, if I could guest blog at a website that's bigger than mine and more credible, well, I'm going to get links back to my website. I can make sure that my name is linked back, but I could also probably mention this other blog post I've done, do a link specifically to that. So do take guest blogging opportunities. If you approach people, a lot of times they'll say yes. Turn mentions into links. If you, someone is mentioning on you on the web for whatever reason, if they're quoting you, or you're in a news article, or someone's blogging and they've mentioned you, have them say, can you, you can contact them and say, could you change my name to a link? This helps Google know that you're credible just through that. And then relevant non-spammy comments. So if you're already going to be commenting on a post and you have something relevant, make sure it's non-spammy, because otherwise people will hate you, then you can do links to your site. Easy way to do it. And then this is a more advanced technique. I really like it, but when, so once you've started really getting comfortable with the other things, you want to go to the next step, then you can actually use Google Keyword Planner for more search details. Um, so let's say I'm doing a post, let's pretend I have a gardening blog, and I want to do a post on porch gardening, and I search for it in keywordtool.io, and I see, okay, people are searching for all of these things, but how many people are searching for them, and what's the competition for these terms? I have no idea from this. So. I can go to Keyword Planner. They've now integrated Keyword Planner into AdWords, which has actually made it a little bit harder to use, but um, and to learn and set up an account without them forcing you to spend money um, on ads, but you can do it. So Keyword Planner, you search for a new keyword, an ad group idea. So I've put in some of these terms that are related to my 
hypothetical blog post about gardening. I'm actually a terrible gardener. <laughs> but if I was a good gardener, these are some of the terms that related to my post. So I type those in, and I click search. And I can actually see, even this graph is interesting, that people are mostly searching for gardening in these summer months. Not many people are searching for gardening right now in November. Then I can also look down here and see, OK, for some of these ter search terms that I put in, I'm assuming this is for November. But these are how many people are searching for it each month. So there's only 40 people searching for this on Google and medium competition. That's not necessarily that great if I want to spend a lot of time on this blog post. But then you scroll down, and you can get all these related keywords that Google is recommending. And so you can see, OK, we've got por front porch ideas has 5,400 people searching for that every month with only low competition. That's cool. Um, back porch ideas, 1,600 people searching for that a month with low competition. And I can say, well, OK, I could incorporate that into this blog post and do a twist on it. Or maybe I'll just save this for my next blog post. And I'm going to do a blog post that has black back porch ideas in the URL and in the title and in the post. And I'm going to drive people to my gardening site because Gardening is connected to back porches, and I could, you know, make that related. So I really like Google Keyword Planner. It's a little harder, but well worth using. So Google is well worth optimizing for. Um, last month, I had 1,100, over 1,100 out of my over 1,700 page visits came from organic search. Most of them from Google, a pittance from Bing and Yahoo and the others. So it's, it's worth your time if you could spend an extra few minutes to do these easy optimization techniques for Google. After you have the search engines, the next up is the social networks. Um, one study showed that as of June 2014, social referral sites are counting for 31% of online traffic. So a year ago, June 2013, it was 15% of online traffic was from social platforms like Facebook, and now it's 31%. So that is worth looking at on your website. Now in terms of traffic, Facebook and Pinterest are actually the only ones sending a lot of traffic overall. This is a study done over 300,000 big websites. Facebook is up there sending 23.39% of all traffic to any site. So any visit to any site at any time, 23% of that is coming from Facebook. Now Pinterest over the last year has been ranging from 5 to 7%. Twitter, everyone loves Twitter. And Twitter is worth doing for developing your audience and your fan base and connecting with people. I'm not saying it's not worth doing. But in regards to links, Twitter's only sending this many links to people's websites. So if in regards to sending links and sending people to your website from these platforms, Facebook and Pinterest are the ones that you should be concerned about. So we're going to start with Facebook because it's bigger. So tip one for Facebook is use an image. Um, there are so many bloggers out there who don't use an image. And you really should. If I share some, a page on Facebook and it doesn't have an image, this is what it looks like. It has an image. I'm taking up almost their entire screen with my cool image, and they're much more likely to read and click through. Um, next step, create a buzzworthy title. Uh, so you want something that is going to invite people, make them want to read. So my most popular po blog post through Facebook links this summer was, my three-year-old took pictures of our beach trip, and they are awesome. It's kind of a catchy title. It's to kind of appeal to a certain fan base. Um, and you know, I, tr I just modeled it on some of those titles. So bad titles that I've seen on blog posts. What I've been thinking about. <laughs> I've seen people posting these awesome things about all sorts of things, and they title it what I've been thinking about. And I'm like, oh, I want to die. Like, you can't do that. Why? No longer yell at my children. Much better title. Um, and there probably are even better titles than the ones I put in my better titles. Mm -hmm. Bad titles in my kind of realm. November updates. When really you should say, my new novel is coming out next month, because people actually care about that, but they don't really care about in another updates. Cool infomercials versus, this is an actual title on BuzzFeed, 26 of the finest acting moments in infomercial history. I want to go see that. So a good way to actually get a sense for what's going to be shared on Facebook is go to BuzzFeed and just spend an hour looking at their titles and seeing 
what makes a good title. Now, sometimes what you'll find is that your goals are at odds with each other. Sometimes a good title for Google is a terrible title for Facebook, and a good title for Facebook is a terrible title for Google. So you have to decide, is this post one that I'm going to get traffic from, from Facebook or from Google? If it's more hedonistic, you may just want to go for the title that's going to do well on Facebook and then create a big, a good optimized you know, group post that's going to be good for Google <coughs> later or other things. So, And sometimes you can create a title that's good for both. Why no longer yell at my children may be good for both if people are searching for yelling at my children, which they probably are. <laughs> I'm a parent, so I can attest to that. They're probably searching for that. So the other thing you want to do is take advantage of the first few sentences. This is an easy writing trick, and, and that's what I'm focusing on today is the content. There's all sorts of other things you can do to promote your content on Facebook, but I'm focusing on what you do on your website itself. So you take advantage of the first few sentences. One, because it's good to have a hook anytime you write anything, English 101. Um, but two, because the first few sentences are actually showing up in Facebook when someone shares your post. So this, something I saw on Facebook yesterday, what happened when I switched to a full body pic for my online dating profile? And then she says, it took me months to finally upload a full body photo to my online da dating pro profile. Because I'm plus side, I figured out that a head to toe picture would prevent men. I'm like, prevent men from what? <laughs> like, can I click through? You know, so it makes you want to read more if you've got a really good, catchy first couple sentences. Well, the next tip is make your posts chirotic or timely. Now there's some things like my 10 keys to writing dialogue in the fiction. People aren't searching for that more or less any time of the year. That's kind of an evergreen topic. But there are all sorts of things that people are searching for more. People are searching a lot for Christmas stuff right now, um, but come January, you're not going to get any hits. Uh, but people were searching for Christmas crafting stuff several months ago. That starts much earlier because it takes a long time to make a Christmas quilt. Um, so the life cycle of a rhetorical situation, you have for fruit um, topics that aren't evergreen all year round, you've got an origin, which is when people start talking about that, whether this is elections or gardening or Christmas presents or uh, some sort of event that's coming up. When people are first talking about that, maturity is kairos. This is the opportune moment when people are, can be influenced, when people really want to read about this, when they're searching for this. Then deterioration, when people are no longer, it's still, some people are searching for it, talking <coughs> about it. Um, for example, we've done some other affiliate marketing, me and my husband, and we found that with gifts, the last few days before Christmas, people stop searching for gifts online because they're like, I better just go to Walmart. <laughs> because you can't ship it in time. And they're like, well, even if I do the one day shipping, what if I'm not home when the mail carrier comes? And so they just go to Walmart. No one's searching for it anymore. Disintegration when uh, people aren't searching for it. So for example, I have a short story, a comedy first kiss story that I've written. And I'm going to post it on my website. Well, I'm going to save it for the beginning of February so I can post it right before Valentine's Day. Because I think that's when it's, it's done now. It's perfect. I've sent it to tons of people. I've gotten really great feedback. People think it's hilarious. But I'm not going to post it now. I'm going to post it in February in hopes that I get more shares on Facebook. Um, tip five, add buttons. There are studies that show that more people share things on Facebook if you have the buttons that make it easy for them to share. It actually brings it to mind. Oh, I did like this. I should share this. There's some debate about like or share buttons. Share tends to show up more prominently in feeds than like. So some people say, oh, only use share buttons and not like buttons. But, it, but like has a lot of advantages too because people are more likely to like something than to share something. So you have to make your own decision on that. And then this is the advanced tip, which I haven't done because I don't feel like my blog is big enough to be worth the effort for it yet, um, is you use Open Graph Protocol. Um, Open Graph Protocol, it, it, for one, it lets you determine how your site is shown on Facebook. So you can kind of determine what that share looks like, what images you use, how it looks. It also makes it so your site becomes a Facebook object. So that way it can show up in the likes and interest section on Facebook. And so it's, it becomes like some kind of graph objects is what it is. So it's a little more complicated. It either requires coding or more advanced plugins. There are plugins that will do it for you though. So that's kind of the next step you want to take from the content from your website side to the next step for Facebook. You use Open Graph Protocol. So, so that is Facebook. So the next is Pinterest, which I'm going to argue is really important. How many of you 
have active Pinterest accounts and that you use them at least once a month. So, okay, so we've got about half the room here. So Pinterest is a visual pin board. It's used for discovering, collecting, sharing, and storing information, ideas, images, posts. Uh, Pinterest is awesome. I've actually had months where up to 30% of my traffic is from Pinterest. I've had days with over 100 click-throughs to one post from <coughs> Pinterest when it gets shared by some big pinners. Um, so 21% of online adults use Pinterest. So 21%, that's actually more than use Twitter or Instagram. Not combined, Twitter and Instagram to mine is more. But separately, more people use Pinterest than use Twitter. More people use Pinterest than use Instagram. Um, and Pinterest, along with LinkedIn users, are wealthier than those who use the other networks. So there's a much higher percentage of Pinterest users who earn over $75,000 a year. Pinterest and LinkedIn are the two kind of networks where your pe the people that are using them tend to have more money. 23% uh, of Pinterest users use it daily, 30% uh, use it weekly. So if we go back to our graph, um, Pinterest has been providing 5 to 7% of the traffic over the last year. It fluctuates a little bit, but it's been moving up still overall. Um, but you should care about it in addition to Facebook, even though it sends to your likes for a few reasons. Particularly, I'm not in retail, but if you're in retail, you really should care about Pinterest. 25% um, of all retail traffic comes from Pinterest. So 5 to 7% of websites overall, but 25% of retail traffic comes from Rinta, Pinterest. So if you're selling something, you need to care about Pinterest. Shoppers referred from Pinterest actually spend more than those referred from other social networks. So referred by Pinterest, average of $140 to $180 per order, according to one study. For, these are for certain websites. Um, versus Facebook, $80 per order, and Twitter, $60 per order. So people that get to your retail website from Pinterest are more likely to spend more money. I'm assuming these are more high-end websites with more expensive items that they've made on this comparison on, but they're more likely to spend more money. And then 43% of Pinterest users interact with brands or retailers on Pinterest, versus only 24% of Facebook users interacting with them. So what you'll see is that Pinterest users expect they want to interact with brands on Pinterest versus some Facebook users do, but a lot don't. But it's kind of expected for Pinterest. That's kind of part of why you're spending time there. Kathy, can I ask a question? Yeah. When you say interact on Pinterest <laughs> with a brand, are you just simply saying they're following that brand, liking yeah. or repinning, um, or are they actually like having conversations? No, I, have to, I think it's, it's I think it comes to following okay. and liking and clicking through. Okay, is what it's talking about. I don't think that even requires actual conversations okay. to be in called engaging, you know, with us. I'd have to look at the study again. Okay. okay, so who, what does the average Pinterest user look like? The average Pinterest user is actually most of the people that raise their hands for using internet Pinterest. It is a woman in her 20s or 30s, um, is the average Pinterest user. 86, but there's a lot of other Pinterest users as well. 86% of Pinterest users are women. So if you care about women as your audience, which you should, they are half their planet, you should be using, they, they are, they really are. Um, and they want to spend money and they like all sorts of things. Um, you should be caring about it. Now, but the male users are 14%, but that's increased a lot. It went from like 8% the year before to 14% this year. So the male user base is increasing. Actually, male users are 20% more likely to buy something they saw on Pinterest than female users. I have no idea why, but if men, men are on Pinterest, they use it well. That 20% is actually buying something for mm. the female in their Maybe it is buying something for a woman, but I actually have a Pinterest gift uh, board in my husband's shops for my Christmas presents from it. So, okay, my first tip is spend a week on Pinterest. It's, it would be like saying, oh, I'm going to write a book, but I've never read one. You, if you really want to be targeting your blog for Pinterest, you really need to go use it and get used to it. Um, here's, seriously, she's mm -hmm. checking out Pinterest. Um, what Pinterest looks like for those of you who don't use it, this is kind of a general look, in that you've got these images that are drawn from websites or uploaded straight here, and you've got who put them up, their description, the description of the item, and these will click and link through to those. And you have all sorts of other functions though on Pinterest. Um, there's all sorts of Pinterest categories. So you can go and browse a board that looks 
you know, browse something that looks like this for a specific category. Yeah. I'm wondering, uh, <coughs> so would you, if I'm pinning something or I'm just using, you know, Pinterest for my own personal use, it's really frustrating when there's not a good image that shows yeah. up uh, attached to that link. And, um, and I know, you know, the images that, that are good for Facebook are going to be, uh -huh. you know, more horizontal and the Pinterest are going to be more vertical. Yeah. Do you, for I, your own blogs, do you just pick a horizontal and a vertical image um, or? I'll talk about that in just a second. I have a slide related to that in just a second, so I'll make sure I address that. <coughs> so Pinterest categories in order of browsing frequency. If you are writing about anything in this first category, tons of people are just sitting on Pinterest pinning those things. However, my, I've had a lot of hits to my website from Pinterest, and I'm over here in the second column, my category that most of my things are being pinned to is from there. And I actually spend a lot of time on like geek uh, Pinterest section, and there's still a lot of activity, even if you get here on this fourth column. Not so much in men's fashion and cars and motorcycles, <coughs> but it doesn't mean you can't optimize for Pinterest anyways. Um, and the reason why you need to spend time there is that things that do, types of pins that do really well in food and drink are not the types of pins that, people, that do really well in film, music, and books. There's certain types of things you can start to notice, oh, people are pinning more this sort of thing, or these are the sorts of descriptions or titles or, oh, it's a lot more common to have text on it for this category than for that category. So you need to get to know what category your things are going to be pinned to. So my next step is always use an image. Now, you can either have your own image if you're a photographer or a designer, or you can find one. There's lots of images online, but I would caution that you want to find images that you have rights to use. I've personally known people that have received very large fines and threats of lawsuits and other things from using images that they did not have rights to. It's just not worth it because there are tons of images that you do have rights to. Um, and that's because of something known as Creative Commons, which is basically artists and photographers and other people who say, I want to share this with the world, I want people to see it, I'm fine with you using this on your website, which is really great. You can actually do Creative Commons searches in all sorts of places. You typically have to do an advanced search. You can find Creative Commons images that people want you to use on Flickr, Comfy, which is kind of based off of Flickr, but pulls things differently. Bing, Google, and then Wikimedia Commons is just devoted to free images that you're allowed to reuse. So if I was to do a Flickr search, I'm looking for stars. I go to the advanced search, I type in stars, and then I go down to the bottom, and I look on Creative Com Commons. So I say, oh, I only want to search within Creative Commons licensed content, only stuff I'm allowed to use. And you can actually use stuff that you want to use commercially. So if you wanted a book cover or something you're actually going to sell, then you want to make sure you check that. Or some, or ones that you want, want to build and modify. You want to be able to change the color on this or edit this, you can click on that. And then you'll search and you'll find all sorts of thousands of images. This is just what came up first. Sometimes you have to browse a little bit to find the really good ones, like the typewriter. It probably took me 15 minutes to find that image. But you find the one that's really going to work for you. So then optimize your image for Pinterest. This will get to what you're talking about, um, what you were at, talking about. So this is the perfect Pinterest image, according to Wired Magazine, a study that was done. It was by Paula Dean. It's a recipe for cucumber, tomato, and onion salad. It's been repinned re over, as of like a year ago, over 307,000 times, this particular image. Um, and it exhibits all the characteristics of things that are pinned a lot. No human faces. Actually, in general, human faces are pinned less on Pinterest than things without human faces. Little background. It's focused on an object. Multiple colors. Lots of red. Red does well on Pinterest. But moderate light and, and color. So not like extreme brightness or like black and white doesn't tend to do as well. And then portrait style. So as you said, horizontal style images do tend to be better on Facebook. They look better on Facebook when they're shared. And portrait style images look better on Pinterest when they're shared. Um, but you can break these rules. And so part of it, you just have to decide, where is this going to be shared more? What's my target? And you also decide what's best for it. So for example, my 10 keys to writing dialogue and fiction, which has done extremely well on Pinterest. It has human faces. It has background. Hmm. It's black and white. It does not have red. It's black and white. And it's horizontal. So I broke all the rules, and it's still done well on Pinterest. but. If I was writing about dialogue, so I'm like, I have to have people in the image. It doesn't make sense to do anything else. 
But if you don't have a reason to do people, and if you really want about Pinterest, want it on Pinterest, then do portrait style. And don't do people. Um, the other thing you can do is you can use good image file names or alternative text. Basically, you can determine how people are going to pin this on Pinterest <coughs> by affecting their subconscious and their ease for laziness. So, for example, this is another blog post I've done, Running Power Mo Full of Motion Defeats in Fiction. So if someone goes to pin my page and they click on this picture, well, I saved this image and uploaded it with this file name, and so automatically it's going to give this description when it comes to pin. And most pinners, if they see this description that you provided and they're like, yeah, I like it. They'll just pin it. Most people won't. If it's a good description, most people won't change it. It's just if it's lacking, then they'll change it, and they might change it to something they do, that you don't want. They might say, this was a cool post. Well, that's not a very useful description for you as a content developer. Wait, can I ask a question? Yes. Is that, okay, that's Pinterest right there, right? This is um, from the bookmarklet. A lot of pinner, avid pinners will install, install a bookmarklet. Or you can walk from Pinterest, you can type in the URL, and then you choose your photo and it brings it to this board, so this page where you get to choose which of my boards do I want to put it on and how do I want it to be listed. Okay, that description, is that being pulled from the alt text of that? Well, that so what happens, what happens is most places like WordPress will, if you don't provide an alt text, they will just pull it from your image file name. So right now it's just pulling it from my image file name. However, this picture on the same post, I saved it as a motion, which is better than image 6572, but it's still not exactly what I want them to do. So I can go back and edit this post, and I can say, okay, I can go in to edit this image just within the post. I'm not editing the image itself, just going to the post, edit the image. This is from WordPress, but you can do it from other platforms. And I can look and see, ah, the alternative text is a motion. It automatically gave it that name because that was my file name but I can just change it, writing powerful emotions in fiction. I can update my blog, and then all of a sudden when people pin this image, it's gonna come up with that, and if someone likes it, they're gonna leave it. And I could put my name in that if I really wanted to brand it, or I could put by Katherine Cowley, or from KatherineCowley.com, or and more tip, you know, and more, you know, other things that you want on there. If people like it, they're not going to bother taking it out. It's gonna look like you want it to look on Pinterest. The next tip is to move people from Pinterest to your website. The risk is that people spend all their time on Pinterest and they read from your stuff, but then they have no reason to actually go visit your website. So for example, you've got this, Tolkien's 10 tips for writers. And if you scroll down on Pinterest, it has all 10 tips, it has every quote from him, it has every detail of his 10 tips for writers. Well, I can look at that on Pinterest. I can blow it up on Pinterest, look at it. I have no reason to go to the website of whoever created that which isn't very useful for me as a content creator. Um, other things that that really happens to a lot is images or photographs or art that people are like, well, this is the final product. I've enjoyed this picture of the moon. I have no reason to go see something else. So you have to really think about, with my particular content, how do I move people from Pinterest to my website? How do I drive those links? So food actually has it easy because people assume, oh, it's a picture of food. If I click through, I'll get the recipe. So if you're have a food blog, it's easy. Um, for your art, you'll often have things that it's put in a context. So here's the picture, it says, 25 mega realistic oil paintings by Dutch artist, and I can't say, I don't speak Dutch, so I'm not even gonna try. Um, and so I see, oh, there's 25 of these paintings? Cool, I wanna go see the other 24. That's gonna move people from Pinterest to your website. Sometimes even for food they'll do this, where you put text on the image itself. Mm -hmm. Holiday Baking 101, and you say, oh, it's not just how to make these cookies, it's Holiday Baking 101, all the, you know, that's going to drive people to Pinterest. Um, 100 plus questions to help you interview your character, it's on the image, even if people put crappy things in their description of like, I took two hours reading this post, which isn't very useful, you've still got what it's about. And it really, you know, there's all sorts of techniques you can do. You just do part of the infographic or other things that you can do that will move people over to Pinterest. The next thing, how many of you know Photoshop? Okay, so about half of you. So if you know Photoshop, that's great. If you don't know Photoshop, I sort of know Photoshop, but I'm not very good at it. And if you don't know Photoshop and you don't have the time or the money to learn, you can actually do your images on PowerPoint. All the images on my website that have been modified, I modified on PowerPoint. It's really easy to do it. So you take your image. What you really should do if you're making an image and you're not a designer 
is go look at examples and say, oh, I like these ones. I like how they did this text. And you imitate it, because that's how you learn if you're not a designer. Um, so I was like, well, I want this text. And I like when people do boxes. And then so I made it transparent. And then I moved it underneath. And all of a sudden, I'm like, that's not bad for spending five minutes, not on PowerPoint, editing an image. Then you can copy it all. And then you do a paste special and paste it as an image. And then you click on it and save as picture. And you've got something for your website. So it may be better to learn Photoshop if you're a really serious blogger. But if you don't have time or energy or money, or it just frustrates you, you can do it in PowerPoint. Um, the next step, you can use Pinit plugins and Pinterest for business. Just like with Facebook plugins, you can use Pinit plugins. Um, Pinterest actually has their own ones that you can use that will integrate with their Pinterest analytics. So you can actually see, oh, people are pinning these at certain times, this is how many pins. Um, and then for advanced tactic for Pinterest, you can use rich pins, uh, which Basically, you can really determine what it looks like on Pinterest, even more so than the other techniques, and have bold and extra information in these categories. Once, like the open graph protocol for Facebook, it does take a little more work. But if you get to that point where you really care about Pinterest and you want to go to the next step, you use rich pins. So in sum, uh, with, you know, so you've got Google, you've got Facebook, you've got Pinterest. I, if I had the time, I would spend 20 hours a week on my blog. But right now, I only have the time to spend a few hours a month on blogging. So I spend that time, but I make sure I spend that extra 20 or 30 percent of time to do some basic optimization for at least one of those platforms. I might say, oh, this one I'm going to optimize for Google, or this one I'm going to think for pay Facebook or Pinterest, because it's made a huge difference in, really, I've done no marketing for my website in the last two years, but I've gone from 175 visits to 1,500 visitors a month just through basic optimization techniques. So it is well worth your time. I recommend it. So. And then any questions, or you can theoretically have two minutes left. And <laughs> and go to lunch, so. hey, that was from the Ignite speech about Jane Austen. That's true. Yeah, this oh, is okay. from, I gave a speech last year about Jane Austen and the art of argument. That, you obviously. That's probably why I came and stared at you in the back. Do I know you? I Austin's on money yeah. now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Off topic. Any other questions about? Where did we get the slide show? Oh, I forgot to put it back here. But uh, if you do slideshare.net slash Kathy Cowley, spelled K A T H Y C O W L E N. So slideshare.net slash Kathy Cowley. It is my only slide deck up there, so you will find it easily. I should use slideshare more. Thank you. Really thorough. Thank you. Thank you. So what is this? And I have business cards oh, if anyone key. wants one. Yeah. It's like office. really an actual, I thought it was like a, like a cover for something. Uh, they were. It's style, it's style 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 style. Style. That's very cool. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. I wanted to ask about your device too, the bigger yeah. thing that yours. This? Yeah, what's that? It's an iPad. Uh -huh. I didn't recognize it with the armor. Because of the car, yeah, my work makes me throw all this on there once I drop it, so. Yeah. Uh, I think they feel more comfortable replacing it if it's, uh... Yeah, if I don't break it. <laughs> That's what it is. It makes it a lot heavier to carry. Of course. Yeah. So. Business Thank you so much. If you want to guarantee that Facebook is always grabbing the image you want, you'll want to do open graphic protocols. So there's actually, I don't know, what's your platform? Do you use WordPress or? I'm just going to start. I'm going to make my portfolio blog scene for a while. Okay. I'm just not writing my own. I work at GoDaddy, so I have to know more than I actually know. Yeah, because now that makes sense. Okay, so you can use products. You want to type in more analytics. 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.